two partners of npci who has joined the call for this engagement with all i am ashutosh um, welcoming you all for this i am the moderator of this session for you all with my team member sandeep who is heading our uh, data science team so uh, just to introduce the speakers today um, from h2o uh, we have sandeep who is director of apec region in the ai solutioning part his team member shivam mansal who is uh, lead data scientist and also a uh, kaggle kaggle grand master kaggle as you know is a very reputed organization and a online website which is uh, running data science competitions and awareness we also have uh, devangna from uh, thoughtworks uh, she is lead data scientist there and she is looking more on the uh, developing the solutions um, and for their own partners and uh, involved in the product management and uh, project management of that as well so to start with uh, devangna will introduce you about the uh, uh, data science how about data science is there then sandeep will discuss about the role of ai ml and uh, shivam will demonstrate you how a project actually can be done in using ai ml so over to you devangna thank you ashutosh um so yeah so i'm just going to do a quick summary of uh, where does data science come from um so if you look at the entire uh, history of scientific discovery and look at the large four paradigms that have stood out uh, in the entire revolution we could um, we could sort of talk about um, empirical evidence which used to be the very first paradigm of scientific discovery uh, which was largely based around um, national observ uh, observations uh, documentation of those patterns and uh, documentation of the behaviors through these ex uh, through the experimentation now a lot of research that's done in drug discovery in pharmaceutical industry um a lot of discovery around the natural phenomenon they all belong to the empirical evidence side uh the second paradigm that came along was that of scientific theory um and it was largely based on defining scientific principles of how you would record observations how would you report um results how would you formulate experiments and then uh, basically rerunning all your experiments uh, through those principles and that was the entire world of scientific theory now a lot of physics laws that came in were from that particular paradigm um the third paradigm that then came in with the advent of computational power was that of computational science um and that required a lot of modeling and simulations um and essentially using computational uh, capabilities to solve complex problems um a lot of stuff that you might have heard around operations research uh genetic algorithms linear programming all of that belongs to computational science now the fourth paradigm of scientific discovery uh, what we are actually focusing on today is that of data science and essentially that became an area where the theory the simulations and the computations all came together so essentially the scientific discovery was led by huge amount of data that became available because um you know internet became that much accessible um you know devices started getting connected globally um and and that sort of led to this revolution so that's a quick history of uh, where did data science actually stand out in the entire revolution of scientific discovery um so it's essentially a interdisciplinary field and hence it is very difficult to define the boundaries of data science so i would say it's a, it's a more democratic field which uh, essentially uses scientific methods processes algorithms and systems to essentially extract out knowledge and insights from different variety of data whether this is structured or unstructured um and when we talk about machine learning specifically and i'll, I'll tell you where does that come from we uh, we are basically looking at two important goals and anything that you can think about in terms of applications of machine learning you can actually very well categorize it in one of these uh, categories so either we are focusing on intelligence so we want to accomplish a um, complex goal by making systems and machines learn um, you know from the data and the patterns that we feed with and that's what is intelligence so that's the goal of intelligence um the other category is that of understanding so can we actually make sense of the huge amount of data that is available to us so um largely a lot of work that we done that that we do um under the field of analytics actually belongs in there so if you were to think of some examples intelligence would basically be to um to ask a robot to pick up you know an object from floor and that is intelligence because it has essentially learned how to accomplish the goal of 
lifting an uh, object and placing it in our surface. Um, detecting fraudulent uh, transactions in your online payment systems is another example of intelligence. When we talk about understanding, it would be essentially saying, can I find uh, you know, relevant documents to my search um, on Google? Or, or um, can I actually find out that in my digital payment systems, where are the key bottlenecks? So essentially what I'm trying to look at is, uh, you know, millions or billions of users behavior data to understand these patterns of interest. And this is always important to understand because it simplifies the entire process of defining a machine learning process uh, once you know what is it that you're trying to achieve. Um, very quick primer, uh, because this might be a question for a lot of you who are not working with machine learning in your day-to-day -day lives. Uh, when we look at where does the, you know, the, the very famous word of deep learning fit into the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, this diagram very clearly represents uh, the kind of relationships they have. So deep learning is actually a subpart of machine learning, uh, which is in turn a subpart of artificial intelligence. Now you can of course ask what are the things that belong to machine learning that do not belong to deep learning? And those would be things like your logistic regressions, um, SVM models, et cetera, right? Deep learning revolves around neural networks largely. When we talk about what is it that belongs to the category of artificial intelligence and perhaps not that of machine learning, you can talk about genetic algorithms. You can talk about knowledge representations. Right. So a lot of those areas fall under machine, um, under artificial intelligence that you necessarily wouldn't put under machine learning. So that's just for your understanding, because I think these days, these two words or these three words are used quite interchangeably. Now, um, going to the uh, to the main uh, meat of this discussion, which is where does data analytics come into picture here? And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of this depends on um, understanding. So understanding the patterns from the data. Now, um, there is sort of a succession in, in terms of different analytics that you look at, and it is very important to understand those because uh, when, you're when you're solving a real world problem, um, this is typically the way you would go about solving it. Um, so you would first start with a question of asking what happened, right? And that is your descriptive analytics. So um, a lot of stuff that we do under trend analytics, sales analytics, marketing analytics, all belongs to the category of descriptive analytics. Um, we are essentially trying to find patterns here, right? So if we take example of digital payment ecosystems, um, you could ask questions such as, um, where are we seeing most of the failures um, in the payment system? Uh, where are the bottlenecks? Uh, bottlenecks? Can we actually look at those numbers? Um, that would be an example of a descriptive analytics study. Uh, suppose you're actually carrying out a fairness study. So um, say there is a payment system that has been employed in a certain geography and you want to really understand whether that payment system actually works fairly for the entire population that it is supposed to serve. Um, then you can look at where are the potential bottlenecks that come in in usage of this payment system if you were to actually do a study with a control group? Um, so if you are, say, looking at a group of people who have certain disability and you are trying to learn uh, patterns of bottlenecks and failures when they are using, say, a certain payment app, um, that would fall under descriptive analysis. Right? Um, the next step is really, once we have identified what happened, uh, the next step is to understand why did it happen in the first place? And that's where you're running diagnostic analytics. Um, so um, understanding uh, you know, the sales pattern in retail industry, uh, doing correlation analysis, um, doing causation analysis, all of that fall, falls under diagnostic analytics. Um, now, if we take the specific example of payment, uh, you could look at why the payments uh, failed. Right? So you have a, a descriptive report that essentially talks about different, say, pages in a certain app where uh, there were payment failures. You can actually go back and really ask question of why did it actually fail on that particular page? Uh, was it that the, um, the API server didn't respond back? Was it because um, the, the app became ir uh, irresponsive? Right? So those are the kind of questions that you can ask. Um, going back to the inclusivity study, uh, when you identify that uh, certain population groups have not been able to 
to work with the app, to work with the system as it was intended, then you can ask questions such as why they were facing that difficulty in the first place. Uh, maybe certain buttons were not visible to them, and you would find that out by really looking at, uh, you know, the data that you would collect around it, the logs that you would collect, collect around it. So it might just so happen that maybe um, the page is not uh, color blind friendly, and that is where certain certain population groups were not able to really identify uh, or, or distinguish those buttons or those elements in the page, and hence they were not able to sort of work with it as intended. That's where your diagnostic analytics would come in. The third one, which is perhaps the most talked about area of analytics, is that of predictive analytics. And there we're, we are essentially asking a what if question. So what will happen if this is the condition? Um, and that's essentially what is predictive analytics. And you are essentially working off uh, you know, a lot of historical data to find patterns and then uh, building models, uh, representation models on those patterns to identify what might happen in the future given a certain pattern. Um, so if you look at the retail industry, uh, the demand forecast um, essentially is all about predicting your demands in the future. Um, uh, doing customer churn prediction. So uh, for instance, when you've identified that there are failure, there are certain failure patterns in your payment app, uh, then identifying uh, what is the chance of a person um, actually dropping off your app because of a payment failure uh, you know, at a certain stage is something that you can deduce from your predictive analytics. Um, when you're looking at specific examples of fraudulent transactions, you can look at where are these fraudulent transactions coming from and essentially build a model to identify that in the future and then say that if there is a transaction that's happening, uh, what is the probability that it is a fraudulent transaction, right? Um, there are a lot of novel, um, there are a lot of novel cases right now where uh, or services where they do dark web monitoring and essentially find out where your private information is floating around um, on the dark web, so that uh, if a payment actually originates from, say, your phone number which is floating on the dark web, then potentially it could, if it, if it is a large transaction, then it potentially could be a fraudulent transaction. Um, so that's the other thing that we are actually working on or exploring uh, for one of the clients. The, uh, the last one is, uh, you know, the holy grail of sorts of uh, analytics, which is prescriptive analytics. And essentially that is to say, can we actually do um, large scale what if analysis on large, large, uh, you know, a set of use cases and essentially say which use case actually optimizes for our goal. So, um, it's basically optimizing for a certain uh, for a certain objective that you have. Um, the pricing um, that is being done uh, using machine learning models in the retail industry to identify what should be the price point of your of your um, of your item in the store so that it doesn't really kill your demand but also gives you the best returns is an example of prescriptive analytics. Um, also, uh, if we again take the case of fraud then it could be around identifying where do we need to have manual interventions coming in if a, if a transaction is uh, flagged as a, as a potential fraudulent transaction. Um, so that would be an example of prescriptive analytics. And uh, just before I go there, I think just wanted to also mention that typically when you go about um, automating something with intelligence, so essentially using machine learning to carry out a complex task, it starts with the process of understanding, which is essentially the very first two steps of analytics, uh, the descriptive and the diagnostic, which actually gives you a very clear pathway into building a complex system uh, that is working off this data and, and automating it with intelligence. So it's very important to not let go of those two analytics part as well. Uh, now with, uh, so I've been in industry for seven years now, working with different sort of clients or different geographies, different, um, uh, different domains, different size. Um, and I think they, I have personally seen, um, you know, some key challenges that come in, in adopting data science. And for a lot of you who actually either work in the space of data science or work at the periphery of it, you might also be familiar with some of those challenges. So I, I thought I'll talk about some of these uh, because as a data science community, it's, it's quite important to understand these uh, challenges, especially when we're looking at not a research statement, but actually, uh, you know, productionizing something and taking it to the to the market. 
Um, so typically, one of the uh, biggest anti-pattern that, that, that I've seen is data science teams often get siloed. So they are working in sort of a COE model, research model, um, sitting quite isolated from business. Um, and uh, I've seen patterns where uh, the data science team actually keeps working for months and years uh, without actually producing anything that can be taken to the market. And this is not to really question the skills, but actually to say that um, the collaboration that should have taken place in terms of developing a system or product couldn't happen because a part, a very key part of the team was actually isolated. The other um, challenge I've seen is where misalignment comes between needs and skills. So sometimes actually what is needed for your say diagnostic studies is uh, is a user researcher, somebody who could who could carry out user research and not really somebody who comes with say a background in deep learning. Right. So sometimes uh, just the fact that the problem statement has not been very clearly identified actually leads to the misalignment between needs and skills and hence leads to frustration both in business teams as well as the data teams. Um, very often it is look at uh, machine learning. The exercise of machine learning is looked at as um, as a research statement um, and the the apps aspect of productionizing it is actually given an afterthought. It, it becomes an afterthought. Um, and when, especially when you're working settings wherein we want data science to produce results, it is very important to look at how can we quickly take that to production. Um, they're often very isolated parallel efforts, again, because the, uh, the program management was not done well. Um, we also need to look at the iterative thinking when we are adopting data science. Uh, you will never have the best um, solution on day one. Uh, it is important to go lean develop solution that you can actually take quickly to the consumers, to the customers, to the users for feedback, and incorporate that feedback um, into your system to actually then carry out the next iteration of your solution, which is a uh, point uh, around uh, missing feedback loops, which I see almost in every system all the time. Um, and lastly, um, um, I have also experienced that there's typical lack of ecosystem thinking. It, it becomes a data science exercise rather than it becoming a business exercise with the equal participation from user researchers, from uh, business uh, folks, from technologists, uh, from data science team, data architects, et cetera. So we need to really look at uh, why are we building a certain solution in the first place and how is that going to impact the end user and the customers? Um, and um, typically in data science solutions, that also goes missing because the focus is so much on just building a fancy data science solution than uh, building a solution that would work for the problem for the users that we are serving. Um, so that was what I wanted to cover. I'm happy to take questions probably towards the end of the webinar. Back to you. Sure. Thanks, Devangna. So I think uh, you have already covered the basics in a very descriptive way and make the audience understand why we are doing data science and what is the need of it and what we can solve out of it. So now um, I'll request Shivam uh, to present it and uh, Sandeep will take over for the session now. So please Sandeep, can you start? Thank you Ashutosh. Thank you Dipangna for the initial session. Yeah. <clears throat> Shivam, you can move to the next slide. So the whole topic today that we are trying to present is uh, the impact of COVID-19 on specifically financial sector, right? The finance industry. Um, so I, Sandeep Sharma, I head the solution engineering team for H2O.ai, which is basically a leader in uh, open source machine learning. Okay? Um, so I've been uh, outside India since the last 22 years and mostly working in the big data analytics space. Um, it is not new. Uh, we have been using regression as one of the you know, uh, primitive ways of, you know, even today for lots of models, you use that. Uh, but with H2OAI, I got the potential to basically move into more, I would say, uh, neural net side of it or deep learning side of it model. So I'm here to present that experience today uh, through this presentation. Shivam, would you like uh, to? Hi, hello everyone. This is Shivam, and I'm the senior data scientist and also one of the Kaggle Grandmaster at H2O.AI. I have experience of working in financial sector, which includes banking, insurance, and as well as healthcare. Um, I specialize in implementing end-to-end -end AI ML solutions using different uh, skill sets and technologies. Um, and uh, I have a master's degree from NUS. 
and I'll be demonstrating a real life uh, demonstration or an application which can be used by organizations and banks to accelerate the AI journey in their decision making. Thanks, Shiva. So this is the new normal, and as we can see, uh, there's a huge impact on uh, on the fintech industry, especially financial financial services, which comprises of banks and insurance, uh, which now just cannot deal with this internal data anymore. They have to bring in these external factors into play, things like unemployment data, things like you know health of a company, uh, before they can take any kind of you know credit risk decisions. Uh, so just to reiterate that, uh, my, my presentation today is going to circulate around those, that topic specifically. Um, so this is a SMP, uh, you know, uh, information or slide that I've taken and built on top of. Uh, it clearly demonstrates that uh, this COVID-19 crisis could add up to $440 billion to the credit cost. And if you eat this properly, the first one that I've highlighted in yellow, the big problem, Group, which is basically which stands for banking industry country risk assessment. Um, you can see that uh, India is, is is right at the top ten countries, which basically has a rating of five, which is not very good. So this was not the case before COVID. So this has changed, uh, as you can see. This this report is dated twelfth of May, and uh, one of the other things that I would like to highlight here on the top, if you look, uh, you know, under the section of uh, credit risk. In the economy, and that is, uh, India has been categorized as very high risk country for that. So, what this means uh, in 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 a banking perspective, that you know, uh, a lot of people are gonna default, uh, not just during this COVID crisis, but probably post COVID crisis. And that's not directly because they are either losing jobs or something, but it could be a lot of other external factors, uh, like probably you know your uh, your, your, your your current scenario, right? So, how do we use up AI in this area? So yes, Shivan. So first of all, uh, the, you know we have to tackle the time to market, and hence uh, you know we have to make use of technology that can automate a lot of these enhanced risk modeling tasks. And uh, you know, uh, fortunately, Shivan will be demonstrating one of those uh, you know risk models that we have built. Uh, it is not going to be sufficient just to use internal data anymore. Uh, you have to bring in external data like census data, uh, your know, things like you know uh, unemployment data from the government. You have to bring data from the from from the pandemic data uh, to enrich your data to see to do this kind of risk modeling, and this augmentation needs to happen through machine learning as well, right? Uh, you just can't uh, you know uh, finish a model and and expect it to be deployed to production. You need to make sure that you do the proper debugging of that model so that you know you can do proper impact and sensitivity analysis around you know whether this model is biased toward a male or a female or for specific postal code uh, so that you know you don't get questioned when you know certain decisions are made uh, on behalf of this model you also need to make sure that these models are tested properly using your what if and sensitivity analysis uh, of course uh, being uh, you know uh, you, you using here some neural nets as well as deep learning models uh, one of the challenges becomes how do you explain those kind of models and that's where you know uh, uh, very important to explain the the model and of course, deployment, you need to continuously monitor the model. You need to make sure that the, when the model gets decayed, it gets retrained, uh, you know, refit. Uh, and it is always, you know, giving the best possible accuracy and results moving forward. So these are the, you know, I would say five key areas that uh, AI can be extremely influential and useful for, for the industry. Now, moving into the next topic, which I'm where I'm talking about more into the innovation side of it. So H2O being one of the open source companies, we have obviously implemented this. But today I'm speaking more from a generic standpoint. Uh, what we notice in the industry is that when we go and work with an mm -hmm. insurance or a bank, especially on the regulated use cases, they are very, very concerned about uh, using any kind of state of the art models. And the reason for that concern is mainly because, uh, you know, they are worried about explainability, uh, explaining the results. Uh, so you know, typically they are stuck with, uh, you know, linear models. And if you would see in a linear relationship, uh, generally, you know, it is, it is, it is just two variables uh, which are directly related in case of independent and dependent variables. Whereas in case of a non-linear relationship, uh, that is not the case. So if you look at uh, typical GBM models these days, they are not only taking care of non-linear relationship, but also interaction between uh, uh, these, these uh, you, know, you know, predictors. So moving to the next slide. 
So this is just explaining how Dr. Shapley has changed this whole space. So people who are worried about the explainability of these SOTA models, it's no more a limitation anymore because uh, what used to be a concern from the practitioners was being able to explain the results. So that being taken care of, and in fact, that's area which is being you know, popularly called as XAI, which is explainable AI, can close that gap between accuracy and interpretability now. And the industry can start enjoying the benefits of these uh, you know, uh, GBM models. For instance, if you notice a quick study on the right-hand side, uh, typically uh, a GLM would not be able to cover non region relationship, which is how humans behave. Uh, it will not be able to look at interaction variables. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, it will take, because of that, it will take a big hit on the accuracy as well. However, the plus point of a GLM model is that it maintains monotonicity, right? Which is, you know, uh, important, especially in case of regulated industries. Uh, but, you know, with the monotonic uh, GBMs, which, uh, which are now available, you can address that concern uh, with GBM that, that becomes a concern, but then a hybrid model can address both. So if you look at uh, a typical uh, you know, cost metrics below that we have put up uh, for a true positive, for a, a true negative, and a, and a false positive, and a false negative, and considering you know, the values that we have keyed in, typically what we have noticed that uh, you, know, you can, with a small accuracy lift of you know, 5 to 6%, you can easily experience huge impact from a business standpoint in millions of dollars. Right? So, you know, when we work with banks and insurance companies, uh, you know, uh, we and we are working with them because the, the modeling is not new to them. They have 10 years of modeling experience, either on a SaaS or SPSS platform. Uh, they're very, very worried about moving to these kind of, you know, neural net or GBM models. And, and, and the main reason they are looking at is probably to get a lift in the fraud or risk model, right? And that makes a big difference uh, in terms of, you know, the delivery uh, that they have. Go forward. So the... Next thing I would like to talk about here is automated machine learning. So typically in my age, uh, where I left India about 20 years ago, uh, you know, and, and we start, we, when we started with the modeling task, we would do that uh, using you know, a typical Python or R, and it would take us good four to six weeks, not just to develop the model, but to optimize the model and then put it to production. And this is, I'm talking about uh, ones which we were really able to make it really fast. Uh, however, uh, you know, it, you know, that, that is not what we have the luxury today of, right? So we have to fast track these AI ML models, especially we are not talking about churn models. We are talking about risk models where the banks are losing money almost by the day. Uh, it's, hence, we need to, you know, optimize and, and, and make sure that these models that uh, are updated uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so automated machine learning can fast track that whole process. Uh, it can give you the statistical insights. Uh, it can automatically you know, create your cross-validation strategies. It can take care of auto-feature engineering, uh, state-of-the-art model selection. So it's not just you know, uh, you know, the typical GBMs or light GBMs, but it can make use of you know, models for time series, for, for NLP, for, 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 for even image detection, for instance. Right? It does the hyperparameter optimization. Typically, these platforms are also able to take care of uh, you know, evolutionary model training using genetic algorithms. Uh, robust feature selection, and in, in the end, what you get is a hybrid model, a strong ensemble uh, that would give you the best possible result. And not only are these platforms able to uh, assist a data scientist in building these models, but it also generates a lot of useful artifacts, like, for example, the full documentation of the model. Right? It, it creates like explainable models, so especially for nonlinear models, it, it, it makes use of surrogate techniques like LIME or, SHAP or, or, or variable importance or or you know, uh, uh, decision trees to be able to explain the results, give you the exact reason codes so that you can satisfy the regulators and the stakeholders. Um, model debugging is becoming very, very popular these days. So this falls into the area of uh, responsible AI, which I'll cover next. But you know, be able to make sure that you know you, you do not have any kind of bias to a certain feature uh, is, is extremely important and very hard for a data scientist to do that uh, unless you are using a platform which is taking care of this automatically. Um, of course, uh, the end result is deployment, uh, which you know is is critical as well. So, with data augmentation, which is the next thing, which where you are bringing in external data to the organization. So, your typical evaluation risk is based on data, but relevant data is not generally available internally. So, you, like in today's situation, uh, you need to definitely take into consideration unemployment data uh, if you were to uh, you know do some kind of you know risk modeling. 
uh, if you are doing especially SME risk modeling, not only do you need that data, but sometimes we even consider the sentiment of a company. Are they hiring or they are laying off people uh, when we are working with the banks to uh, build these kind of models, right? So external data has become extremely important uh, to be combined with internal data to get proper, you know, uh, put out of it. Now, you can't do this manually. It is not like a field matching like we used to do. So you have to make use of machine learning here and AI driven machine learning to basically uh, augment, auto augment this data points so that you can not only get uh, augmented intelligence out of it, but also very perfect models, which can give you very high accuracy in these times of pandemic. Next slide. Now, uh, this is the last topic that I would like to elaborate a little. So responsible AI. Uh, so for example, in Singapore, where I live, there is a paper that, uh, you know, the regulators have come up with, it's called FEAT, F-E-A-T, Fairness, Ethics, uh, Accountability, and Transparency. And that is a principle now almost uh, by all the regulators. Uh, so especially with these machine learning, trying to use more and more, you know, uh, uh, neural nets as well as deep learning models, it, you know, they want to enforce that you know these are very transparent they are not a black box and hence you know you have to make sure that everything that you do within a model where you're using your code is is fully explainable it, it, it basically uh, you are able to interpret the models using techniques like shapley or techniques like partial dependency plot you know things like surrogate models uh, so that you can explain that in greater detail and, and it doesn't look like a black box you can download those results as well it should be ethical in the sense that you know it should your models should you should make sure that they are not biased to a certain person or race uh, when you're building them and and some countries actually enforce that uh, it's not so much as as far as i understand based on my experience enforced in india but we are seeing that it's coming uh, there as well singapore didn't used to have it till last year and they have now rolled out uh, this paper which now is more like a guideline for any fintech company here uh, to make sure that they are not making use of race or gender uh, in, 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 and it's not biased towards one, right? Uh, making sure that it's secure, it's human centered and it's compliant, right? Um, so this kind of, uh, you know, is like a framework that most of the, you know, AI ML platforms of today uh, are moving towards. Next slide. So this is just reiterating uh, from uh, the company that I work for uh, the same same principles. So not only uh, modeling is important, but post modeling, making sure that it is fully documented, uh, so that you know you can share it with your auditors or regulators to get it deployed to production. Uh, it is interpretable in the sense that you know you can explain the results using surrogate models or using you know Shapley values or reason codes. Uh, and of course, uh, you should be able to diagnose the model uh, as you test with new data so that, you know, if the model decays, you are able to retrain and refit and, and readjust these models as well. So that falls into the MLI category. Slide. So with that, uh, now on the innovation side, so today the focus is uh, on a specific use case around lending. Um, and uh, based on my experience consulting with clients, uh, when it comes to credit risk, uh, lending forms a big part of that whole portfolio. Uh, so there are five key metrics generally that uh, you know uh, banks would consider when it comes to uh, building a, a, a model around around risk uh, for lending, right? Uh, so the first one is the uh, probability of default. How likely uh, is a person supposed to default? So you know that you know, you can build a AI model quickly to do this kind of prediction. So it's a multivariate analysis that you do, and you build a model to do that. Uh, the second the uh, most important metric here is a uh, loss of given default. So, you know, if a lender is, is, is where, where, where to default, what would be the typical loss to the, to the bank? And the third one being EAD, exposure at default. Uh, what would be the bank's exposure when this kind of loss uh, is, uh, you know, is incurred? So a typical expected loss ratio is, uh, is multiplication of all these three factors. Now, specific to mortgage or, uh, you know, lending, uh, the four pros are risk. Uh, as well as, you know, some kind of, you know, leeway if you want to give to the customer, uh, you know, which will be those likely customers to give that leeway to the request to temporary hold of a foreclosure. So these are the five key metrics that banks are considering when building a lending use case using, a, you know, AI or ML model. So the next thing that uh, Shivam is going to demonstrate is a quick example of such a application. Over to you, Shivam. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep, uh, for sharing a lot of such useful insights. So in terms of lending, so typical engagement that looks around this use case starts with understanding the problem statement or identifying the data sets, augmenting with external data sets, 
performing the modeling and then in the end taking those business decisions where we are performing what if analysis and other comparison scenario based modeling and of course automatic uh, machine learning for automatic augmentation remains the most important piece for this whole use case let us let's look at how uh, this actually looks in a practical scenario so this is one of our platform college to q and essentially what we can do in this we can uh, add some of the data sets that Shiva, we want to uh, analyze browser is not visible i think you need to share the browser okay let me just give me a minute hey, is it visible now yes okay thanks sorry about that so this is our platform h2oq and what i have done here is i have already uploaded sample australian loans data which is from sme loans we see things like some small medium businesses we see some other details like owner demographics um some of the loan and banking information and in the end we have a, a target variable whether they going to default or not now important point to note here is that this is all the historical data that the banks might have collected but as we discussed that due to situations like covid many things have changed so it becomes important to augment these kind of data sets with the external information and that's where in these applications the one of the first step we can do is intelligently augment the data sets with external data sources so what we, what we can do is there can be multiple data sources some data can be public some data can be private some data need to be obtained uh, via special privileges special apis etc so uh, what we can do is we can pull all of that together and pull all of that and try to combine it with the original loans data that we just saw so here what i'm trying to do is i've connected to one of the external data source and what i'm in interested to look at is some of the business entity registration details uh, their social sentiments what people are talking about those companies the demographics and census information and and most importantly due to covid uh, there has been a lot of impact so we want to understand what are the covid cases in australia by different date by different regions and of course it also has affected mobility because people have started changing so as a company we want to understand how these signals might affect let's say the loan performance so what essentially happens here is this app performs automatic joining automatic machine learning to augment the information present in these data sets and then in the end it produces an augmented table which looks something like this where we have all the original data or all the original column but if we scroll to the right we see some new columns have been added for example their social sentiment data their registration details um details like how many cases have occurred what is the mobility change for, um and what are the demographics of different regions where they belong now what we want to do with this data set is is we want to now train our machine learning models or rather use automatic machine learning modeling uh, where we want to start automatic machine learning experiments so that's where what we can do is we can connect to our platform which is called a, uh, driverless ai where we can actually um, start the experiments which can be used for automatic machine learning training so in these experiments what we can do is we can bring in that data set that we just saw in that we can let's say do loan performance on, on augmented data and just launch an experiment and all of the steps that we discussed in terms of preparing new features which may be more data specific features or creating some uh, transformations on the data sets and then training different machine learning models in the in fine tuning those models and then also combining those models together in order to understand what are the best possible results that we can get from a data set like this so what essentially is happening here is the this mechanism this experiment is trying to learn different patterns from the data set and in the end it will generate a predictive model that banks and companies can use to start taking their decisions so what we just saw is, is this one particular dot which is one of an experiment which is one of a machine learning model which is light gbm in this case it is learning from the data and then this process iteratively keeps on evolving and in the end we're going to get a deployable model that we can use in our business case in this case it is lending 
So let's see how we can actually use that. So we're gonna choose the same data set that we used that we have already augmented. We're gonna choose our um, our model that we have we have trained using automatic machine learning, and we can select our target column. And then as a business user, we want to perform some sort of what if analysis, what if analysis or scenario based modeling. For example, as a bank, we want to understand, let's say if there are three different scenarios or say two different scenarios, we want to understand what will what will happen if let's say the net net income of different people increases in one scenario or maybe it become worse in the other scenario. Or maybe they want to understand, let's say, what is the effect of COVID cases? So if we have a variable here called COVID number of cases, what will happen if COVID cases uh, becomes more than 1 million? Or maybe in one case, they continue to be at the same number which they are currently. So then we can pick this kind of an information and some other meta information. And then we can actually create those scenarios. For example, in this scenario, we want to set a default likelihood of say um, 0 0.22. In this scenario, we want to say net income of people is somewhat on the lower side, let's say around 20,000. Uh, the original DTI ratio, which is more like an interest ratio, it can be around 6%. But in the other scenario, in the other what if scenario, we are doing something else. We have a different threshold value. We assume that people have slightly more higher income as well as slightly more income ratio. And if we had, let's say COVID, we have, let's say, we can simulate those COVID values as well. So what actually will happen now is all that data will be simulated in dif different scenarios. The same machine learning model that we trained here will be used to score the population and will try to understand whether they're going to default or not. And in the end, it will generate a very comprehensive uh, report and dashboard, which will show all the results. For example, in this scenario one, the expected loss is around 8,000. We can see all the other stuff like what is the distribution of default. So most of the people will have high chances of default. We can see where these defaults are happening in lending, and we can see uh, different comparison of defaults by different categorical variables. And then we can also look at scenario two. In scenario two, the numbers will be slightly different because we chose different thresholds. For example, in this case, expected loss is somewhat lesser. And again, we can compare all the similar stuff that we saw. But the story doesn't end here. As a business user, we cannot just take this model and start uh, taking decisions. We have to be fully aligned with responsibility. We have to understand what whatever decisions we are saying, especially in lending, where we are saying that uh, we that one of this person or one of this SME will be rejected alone, while the other will be accepted alone. So we have to provide stakeholder all the explainability and transparency, which should be aligned with all these elements of responsible AI. So in this platform, what we can also look at what are the different Shapley values, which essentially conveys what are the top features, which has the highest impact when we want to understand whether they will default or not. We can look at the reason codes, which is more like why the whys of a prediction, why a particular customer or a bank or an SME is given a particular prediction. For example, in this case, this, this person or this SME is likely to have a default prediction of 0 0.78, which means 78% chances are there that they're gonna default. And why is it so? Because of these reason codes, because their net income is probably not good. Their other loans are not on the good side. The loan type is probably something different and loan purpose, et cetera. So we can understand what are the different trends of the machine learning models and why the model is taking particular business decision. We can also look at how the model gonna behave or react when uh, certain values in our data set changes. For example, here it conveys the partial dependence of uh, our model. So when the income increases, so there are chances that uh, maybe the defaults are likely to reduce. And also model fairness. We want to make sure that, uh, let's say, across the region, across the genders, or across different categories, the model is almost fairly accurate. What we see here is that in Western Australia and in New South Wales, our model is slightly more accurate than in the other regions. Well, this might be a signal of a little bit of biasness present in the model or in the data set. So as a user, we can go back to our original data or maybe as a model and tweak something and try to fix those problems. 
and in the end we provide all the transparency that we want to share that uh, our model is not just a black box it is in fact a simple decision tree though behind the scenes it will be very complex but this is more like a simpler explanation which can of course be given in a form of a document uh, to explain what all steps that we have taken in this whole modeling process so typically that used to take a lot of time a lot of effort with automated machine learning and platforms like this it can be accelerated it can be uh, produced very quickly and at the same time it will be most accurate at the same time it will also be more transparent and aligned with responsibility so yeah that's the that's pretty much from the demo i would like to pass back to ashutosh Thank you. Uh, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shivam. It's, it was very insightful. Uh, people are asking why we are not doing for NPC error, but this is uh, this is uh, what I'll say is for everyone. Uh, it's not like NPC wants to solve some cases using AI ML, but uh, we want to spread the awareness that how these models work, how AI ML they can also leverage for making their own models in future. So thanks for the session, um, Devangna, uh, Shivam, uh, Sandeep. Uh, the first question I want to ask to my teammate Sandeep Reddy. So uh, the question is there that how are we planning to integrate these technologies with NPCI? So if you can throw some light, though we have already covered it in the last session, but on brief, if you want to cover it. So uh, see, uh, one of the major challenges with the um, fintech companies or uh, companies like NPCI is the amount of data volumes that, that we deal with. Like we typically see uh, just one product UPI, we have uh, probably around four to five crores of transactions per day. And now uh, when you are working with that, that uh, volume of data and also the features that you want to build on that volume of data, I feel some of these platforms like uh, H2O.ai and others will definitely help us in, in uh, building these pipelines much efficient way and running our models through that. So, so these are some of the. Uh, I think I think these are some of the platforms that are coming up, especially to cater to, to these segments. So, so that is one way we want to leverage at NBCI. Okay. So last time, as uh, people can see the video in YouTube, also that we have covered uh, the use case on fraud. How we are using these AI ML models for fraud detection at NBCI. So that is the answer which we can give. But uh, coming to the basics, uh, so I'll start because Devagna has given the first session. So I'll come to that. She has, she has talked about the types of analytics. That's fine. But can you just uh, give audience a view on how the product, product management or project management can happen uh, in a data science project? You should throw some insights on it. Sure, Ashutosh. Um, so some parts I already covered. Uh, I think before the webinar was starting, I think Sandeep and I have, were having a conversation on some of the challenges that come in with respect to product management and pro project management when we talk about data science projects, right? Now, data science projects are inherent, inherently a little bit different than the regular projects. Um, in the regular projects, the, uh, the entire roadmap is quite deterministic of sorts because you are essentially sort of doing um, product study and embarking on laying down this, uh, this product roadmap there is there is probably very little um, ambiguity, uh, the kind of ambiguity that comes in when we are dealing with algorithms, right? Because we don't know whether the first thing that we are trying to convert as a feature would become a feature that is deliver that is uh, backed up with machine learning or not, because you first have to carry out that experiment, right? And an experiment that is successful today, a machine learning model that is running today may not actually work in the future as well, right? So those are the kind of nuances that come in. Now, uh, when we look at um, the the uh, product roadmap of a data science project, I think one of the things that we really sort of focus on is what is the experience, what is the feature that we are trying to deliver? Because at the end of the day, it is about carrying out a certain task. Now, either that task is being carried out in very defined steps, or it is being ca uh, carried out with the help of machine learning intelligence that is being given to the user. Right. So the end part is the end goal is about carrying out that particular work. Now, uh, what we typically do is we look at something called a triple track methodology, wherein essentially you lay down the path of 
um, of the product uh, evolution itself. What product are you trying to build? You run a parallel track, which is around experimentation. And the experimentation can be either your user research experimentation or a data science experimentation. Right. And the third one is about productionizing. So you program manage it in such a way that your production track is actually running two weeks, at least two to three weeks ahead of your experimentation track. So you're doing experimentation well ahead, well ahead of time. And you're looking at whether it is actually going to be feasible for you to deliver intelligence through this experiment or not. Right. That provides us the buffer to experiment and then say, I'm happy by taking happy with taking it to the end production stage, and then I can sort of push push it to the production, right? Um, the other aspect of it is also establishing a platform where you can continuously run experiments. One of the uh, challenges I was talking about was that you know a lot of these experiments are done in isolation; they are not run on any kind of say staging or testing environment, right? So one of the things that we do is, and we call it continuous delivery for machine learning. We establish your delivery pathway for any kind of experimentation so that you can carry out these experimentations in very lean way and really talk, sort of take it to you know, some kind of canary mode or ghost mode and, and carry it out in the real world, get feedback, and then you know, work upon that experiment's next phases. So those sure. are the kind of things that we look at. Yeah. So Sandeep, an extendable question to this only. So uh, being running a platform like H2O, uh, how do you determine that which, so we have talked about three, four scenarios and uh, so many models have generated by itself. So what is what are the key parameters which will be used to determine that this, this model is working fine and this can be taken to the production data as well. So my understanding is that first we have to do it with the test data and understand that model is working or not, the classification or regression, whatever it is doing at the end, it is coming up right or not. But uh, what are those key things which has to be considered while taking it to the production data and then into the live production? So that's my question. Well, working with the business, uh, it is really important to be able to explain the stakeholders uh, what the outcomes look like. Right? Uh, so respective of the use case, whether it's a classification or regression use case, uh, they don't understand AUC, they don't understand uh, you know, RMSC. So for them, cost metric is very important. What is the actual value that they associate with a, you know, a, a false negative or a false positive, right? Uh, so those those kind of calculation metrics that you have to apply to the results mm -hmm. of your model, and then be able to justify whether that makes sense for the business or not is important and critical for deploying the model. So it's not just you know my, my model is seventy percent accurate doesn't mean it's a bad model, and ninety eight percent accurate doesn't mean it's a good model. So when it comes to cybersecurity use cases, even one, you know, miss can be a billions of dollars in losses. So there we have to be very, very highly accurate. But when you talk about, uh, you know, risk modeling, you know, even something which is as close to, you know, 80% accurate, but is trying to save the business a lot of cost um, can be a, a considered a good model for deployment. So deployment is all related to cost metrics, I would say. Great. Uh, so uh, Shivam, I'll ask you one question, then we'll take an audience question. So you have talked about scenarios. Um, I want to understand how you will validate. There's a cross. There's a process called as cross validation to improve the uh, accuracy of the model. So if you can throw some light on uh, cross validation, checking the accuracy thresholds, all those things, how you can parameterize those stuff in your model. Sure, sure, Ashutosh. So that's a very important question. So. A uh, validation essentially becomes a very important part of any data science workflow because we want to actually understand how our models are reacting or behaving or what sort of outputs or predictions are they are generating in our training data set or universe of data that we have. So for validation, there are typical techniques like what we can do is uh, apply things like k-fold cross validation, which so is a pretty simple idea but it is very powerful. The idea is to break down our data set into two parts. Uh, let's say one part is 80%, we're gonna train on that part. And then before going to production, before taking it to business user, we can first check the accuracy performance on the remaining 20% part. And we can repeatedly uh, uh, iterate this process so that we can understand the model is more generalized, rather it is not overfitted to one of the data. And then when we are creating the scenario for scenario-based modeling, we can do this thing in different scenarios as well. So the idea is that uh, as a 
from data perspective and a machine learning perspective, the model should be robust. The model should be uh, less of, uh, there should be uh, no overfitting and more generalizable. And also at the same time, for validation, human involvement is also important before taking it to production or real use cases, actual domain scientists and expert people should also validate that the decisions made by the model somewhat align with what they have seen, what they have uh, understood from the experience. So it, it is a mix of both technical approach as well as the human approach. Great. Um, thanks. Uh, uh, I have one sure. question to uh, HTO team. So, uh, uh, Sandeep Sorry? and Meshivam, so uh, some of the models that we build at uh, NPCI, typically we are going with the approach of exposing them as a microservice. And that could be for multiple reasons because uh, data science team is more comfortable with uh, Python and they're more comfortable building services which are which are more related to Python. So you from the overall industry experience, the other clients that you see, what is the pattern that you're seeing in terms of uh, service? I mean, in terms of the model delivery to different platforms and different architectures, mobile and edge, edge devices and things like that. If you, if you can talk a few things about that. It would be great. So uh, I'll take that question, Shivam. Uh, it, it actually goes by the personas of people that we are dealing with within the company. So like you rightly said, at, you at NPCI, your team is probably using Python to build most of the models. And uh, like I said, H2 platform has a very powerful, you know, open source library that, you know, uh, can scale on big data, can do distributed learning and can be deployed to production. But we are also dealing with a lot of business users who are you know, working with very limited knowledge of Python for sometimes, right? So they are, they, they basically are actuaries, let's say from insurance, uh, they are statisticians, but not necessarily a Python developer. So for them, uh, this kind of a platform also assists them to uh, come up with more accurate models than actually a data scientist, because they really understand the domain, uh, when they build these models. Uh, so this can become a sketching platform. But uh, for large problems or big data problems, you can take this sketch and then put into your pipeline uh, for, for machine learning and, and for deployment, right? So as a data scientist, you know, you can collaborate with your business uh, to deliver some of these kind of use cases uh, with, 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 with end to end. This. So you have definitely, you can use the libraries in, in Python to basically build your model. But if you're not a developer, you can use the UI based approach where you can you know, literally create a use case, domain use case uh, uh, within minutes. And then you can use this sketch uh, to further build the pipeline. Shivam, you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to add one very small point that with all these platforms, essential, all the final goal is to bring those artifacts out of that platform. So what the technique that we use is that we compile all of that big work that has gone into a machine learning experiment into a very small low latency uh, code, which is more like a high frequency, low latency code, which can be then used to deploy it to anywhere. You mentioned about IoT, you mentioned about smart devices. So even that Mojo file, which is in some less KBs or even maximum some MBs can be taken to say smart refrigerators or maybe some drones, which can take the real time data, do the real time scoring and then uh, generate the predictions. Yeah, and that is also important in terms of GDPR. So you're not bringing any data back to the server for scoring you are actually scoring on the edge device itself. Exactly. <clears throat> so that was my question on the compliance part. See, data uh, can't come freely. Uh, it has some compliance associated with it. So you answered it now. Uh, that's right. So one question uh, which has been asked in the chat is on comparing with AlphaGo Zero, where uh, a deep learning is used to train the data. Uh, what are your views on it, uh, Devangna? First, you can start and then I ask. Uh, Sure. Um, so um, I think the question here to ask is what are we trying to achieve through uh, the kind of automation that we're trying to bring in through the deep learning, uh, deep neural network, right? And the idea is essentially to say, I want to learn patterns. I want to learn behavior. Now, essentially what we do as part of uh, defining business rules is that there is an SME who has real human knowledge, human intelligence, who's taking their experience, their behavior, their um, their knowledge and turning that into uh, a model that can be simulated, right? Uh, which is here the business rules. Uh, what we're trying to do with, uh, say, something like AlphaGo is essentially to say that what I have now uh, to replace that years of knowledge and experience is basically a huge amount of data. And that, uh, that data is basically giving me a snapshot of the world. Can I look at the snapshot and make my inferences? Right. So there, the basic premise is essentially that you have enough data 
that brings in the kind of variations, the kind of behaviors that a real human being is experiencing in their lifetime, right? So definitely this can be done. Um, you know, it's just a matter of like whether you have that data point or not. The other aspect is uh, one of the um, one of the brilliance of human intelligence is that when you ask a human why is this thing happening in a certain way, either you will get an assumption from them or you will get uh, you know their experience coded as something that is explainable. If we are replacing that with a, a AlphaGo-like system, uh, we also have to ensure that the same kind of explainability or clarity is coming in and transparency is coming from that system as well. Right. So at the end of the day, it's going to be a matter of whether you have that data or not. And also, what are you accomplishing with the system? Is it going to make life death decisions for somebody or is it just going to you know, make a decision of whether I can charge 10 more dollars to the customer? Great. Sandeep, your views in one or two lines, uh, then I have last two questions for you guys. You are on mute, Sandeep. Yeah. So from my understanding, you know, this is just another neural net uh, which is being trained uh, to basically augment human decisions. Uh, so it's not about modeling techniques. It's more about, you know, being able to address a business challenge uh, in a more effective way. Uh, that's what I feel. Uh, Shivam, you want to take a perspective on this? Yeah. So, so one of the key takeaway that is part of this question is the reinforcement learning and my view on reinforcement learning is that it, it can give us uh, some level of uh, uh, I, like it can show us kind of some possibilities which might happen. So if you talk about use cases where let's say a lot of incoming population is there and we, we don't know what who, or who they are. So reinforcement learning can try to segment them and try to give us some insights. For example, in typical marketing case, we get a lot of leads. So with the reinforcement learning, with some A-B testing, we can get what kind of population uh, is likely to go into category A, into category B, into category C, which is on the similar lines as a, let's say a classification problem or a clustering problem, but in more real world scenarios where we don't have, let's say past labels, we have just the new data, reinforcement learning can be a good tool. And when we can combine this with all the other stuff, with our historical knowledge, as well as domain knowledge, as well as machine learning capabilities, then the whole solution can become more powerful. So it's not about choosing and picking one of the technique to solve a problem. It can, it, it's more like combining different together, ensemble them and then take a, a stab at the business problem. Sandeep uh, from NPCI, you have some views on it? So uh, some of the practical challenges in applying uh, these techniques that uh, industry like ours is the amount of the labeled data. So when you want to train systems like this, you really need to have huge amounts of uh, labeled data uh, to build deep learning models. And uh, and we at the payment industry struggle with that. So so these are some of the practical challenges that we have in implementing this. Sure. So, so to cover that point on the data preparation for the next session, we are planning that only. Where we are inviting the guest who will talk about how the, to prepare the data and end-to-end -end flow of a model like what are the different steps for model building and how they can validate test and deploy it in the production in the next webinar which we are doing for the data science series so uh, last question to shivam only because um, he explained the graphs and reports so i'll uh, ask him this question can you just explain in few lines what are the key skills required for data scientists so i would say firstly the anyone can be data scientist uh, like the data science industry is not like that only say programmers or math people or physicists, they become data scientists. So what we have seen in last five years, how this industry have evolved, people from very different backgrounds are in the data science field and they are quite good. They are the top data scientists all across the globe. So I would say people need to be dedicated enough just to become a data scientist. And when we, when it comes to uh, the specifics, I would say uh, understanding of mathematics, bit of uh, statistical practices, uh, some form of uh, some sort of programming, uh, things like Py uh, Python or R, uh, and then some knowledge of different techniques that we generally use in data science, which involves machine learning algorithms, maybe natural language processing, time series forecasting, a knowledge of these uh, is something that will be very helpful. 
And when we talk about a complete data scientist, so then we can also think about having skills on the data engineering side, data preparation side, uh, data storytelling, data visualizations, uh, and also a bit of uh, model or monitoring, which, which requires skills like DevOps and all. So this is more like sure. a complete scenario, but uh, just the short answer is, uh, start with mathematics, statistics, and a bit of programming. Sure. So I'll request you offline to share with us some of the links which uh, people can relate and go on and understand about this domain. So uh, just to conclude the session, thank you, uh, Sandeep. Thank you, Devangna. Thank you, Shivam. And thank you, Sandeep from NPCI as well to join the session. And uh, it's very insightful. Uh, hope to hope to get more insights from you in, in the future as well. Thanks, everyone, for joining the session. Uh, have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, NPCI team.